All right, this is part two of the Art 101A, April 24th lecture about pop art and abstract expressionist art. Everyone in. Oops. Welcome back. All right, we were talking about m maybe here. And I believe it was Megan who was talking about m maybe. Yes. All right, you there, Megan? So uh, can you pay, sit, read that caption to us one more time, please, so we can uh, pick up where we um, left. Maybe he became ill and couldn't leave the studio. Right. So, you know, there's a, a humor. I think it's, it's important. I think it's good that you said that because I think there, it is intentionally funny. And I think you can understand this pop art as very much trying to um, kind of liberate artists from even this sort of abstract expressionist art we saw like Jackson Pollock, where it's so like out there, it's so pure, it's so like, like, like trying to be this sort of other world and, and yet it's so disconnected from sort of subject matter that I think when you look at this artwork, that's kind of what it's sort of rejecting. It's saying, look, you don't need to be sort of otherworldly. You, you, you can relate, remember you can relate more to people when you provide something familiar, something, and we know what, what when we historically or typically have defined familiarity in this class, it usually means naturalism, right? I can see that, it looks like the world, I'm familiar with the world I know, and that looks like the world I know, and now I have a relationship with the artwork. Well here, the relationship isn't so much about, does this woman look like a real woman, but it's rather, oh, this reminds me of comic strips, and I know comic strips, and I relate to that. So when you look at pop art, it's almost like they're recalibrating our understanding of rela relatability, not in terms of naturalism, but rather in terms of consumer culture, right? And this is like comic book consumer culture. So Megan, what do you think this painting is about apart from maybe that little background? What's, what's, the, what's the comic, this, the little moment in the comic about? She's probably waiting for um, a guy to come and he just never came to her. Right, so it's sort of like uh, he, the artist take, took this one little fragment of a story from a comic strip and somehow decided, okay, this little moment is filled with enough sort of maybe mystery or enigma that is worthy of transforming into a much bigger scene, right? And you might consider, well, you know, it's a female subject. She, there, is there an emotional connection here to her? Um, she looks upset, so that's emotional. Yeah, she's, she's distraught. She looks like she's touching this, like, like the side of her face, maybe like like out of worry, maybe like the scream. We saw the screams kind of kind of freaking out. And definitely the language itself is sort of like, maybe, so she's a little like emotionally kind of involved in whatever she's thinking about, like maybe the guys stood her up. And so I think the artist might have just taken that moment in the comic strip and realized, okay, there's some kind of emotional quality to it, especially if I blow it up even bigger and put it on the wall in the museum, is sort of forcing you to, to to sort of question, well, is this art and why not? Um, and I think you could see sort of the use of primary colors, very bold, visually bold. Um, and sort of there's a, you know, it's sort of a familiarity to the comic book world we all know. We'll kind of see some of these, these themes. Notice we're in the 1960s now. And let me move on to another one. And of course they come from comic strips. You can see Superman here on the right. Now, Andy Warhol, is a, is a really interesting figure too, and probably a bigger than any other artist in the 20th century. Um, have we seen, uh, let's see here, have we seen anything, uh, any artwork showing products yet besides the, the comic strips we just saw? I mean, the, here we actually have someone painting a, a can of soup. So the challenge here would be, how do we extract any kind of meaning from something that's so everyday? Um, Jocelyn, are you there? You got Jocelyn there? Yeah. Oh, hey, Jocelyn. So what kind of meaning can we, can we extract from this can of soup? <coughs> I'm sorry? What kind of meaning can we, can we get from this can of soup? Why do we what care? Do you... Hold on. Let me, um... let me, let me mute the uh, others. Yeah, are you, there, are you there, Jocelyn? Yeah. Um, so but let me put it another way. Is it hard to, is it almost like like a big challenge to extract some kind of meaning from this? 
Yeah, it's just a can of soup. Right, exactly, exactly. Right, it's just a can of soup. And I think that would be what, if, if Andy Warhol were here, he would say, yes, precisely. So what do you think? So how, what, huh? So what, what, what would be the parameters of his sort of decision to make a picture about a can of soup? Well, let's try to tackle it. What, what might be motivating him to say, hey, I'm gonna paint a can of soup and you have to look at it as art. Why do that? Um, because it's gonna make people question why he, why he what? painted the can of okay, soup. Okay, number one, maybe why paint a can of soup? So it's already full of sort of almost kind of awkwardness, right? It's very awkward, very uh, sort of challenging to our, what we expect artwork to be. And why is it such a challenge? It's still paint. Because that's not what like normal artwork, artwork looks like. And, and why this specifically? Why is this so um, unlike artwork? What, it, what about it makes it so sort of anti-subject matter? Because it's just a can of soup. Like there's no deeper meaning that you can find in a can of soup. Right. I think, and I think that's part of it. Like sort of it's a consumer product that is sort of a, the same as every other can, right? And I think that's sort of kind of what, what he's getting at. There's, you couldn't find something more devoid of meaning, right? I can't, you can't pick anything that's less sort of artsy than a can of soup. And why is specifically, what about it makes it so like lacking in any meaning whatsoever? Um, there's no like individuality to it. Like it's good, good, like, good. Hold that thought though. Hold that thought. It's, there's no individuality, right? A, every can of Campbell's soup is identical, right? Yeah. And you can see that already corresponds to the fact that, well, then a painting of it likewise would not be original, right? Yeah. And so he's sort of like rejecting originality outright, which is whether or not you think that has merit is, is, is another question, but Definitely a key way of understanding this is the artist is outright rejecting the idea that his work is original and he's almost making his artwork as mechanically reproducible as a can of Campbell's soup. What else, what else about it? What else maybe is something that makes the Campbell's soup so opposite of anything worthy of subject matter? Um, that might be it. Yeah, I, I, I might point out one thing. What, what do you, let's say, ignore the painting for a moment. What do you think about Campbell's soup, just based on the labeling here? It looks good. What's good about, what looks good about it? Very neat. Very and neat, very tidy, right? Very like a tidy kind of like, now when you think of soup, what do you think of? Like a, can, what kind of soup is this? Tomato. So where, what's, what about the soup references tomato? What about the can, the labeling? The red top, like okay. the red half. Yeah, the number one, the color, like, you know, the label, and maybe the word tomato, but is there anything else that has any reference to tomato? Um, I mean, it's just the color and the word, right? Yeah. And yet, you know, there's something like where we're like, okay, yeah, that's soup, there's soup inside. And I think there's also sort of a subtle commentary on just how kind of this packaging and consumer culture is oddly devoid of any value, just like the artwork too. You look at a can of Campbell's soup and we're like, oh, soup. But when you really look at it, it's like, if you gave this to our great grandparents or anyone before them, do you think they would think, oh, I'd like to eat this? No. No, and I think that's analogous to the artwork too. It's like he's sort of showing that there's something about consumer culture that's oddly kind of off. Or another way of thinking about it, you might say that maybe he's making even a political, a slight subtle political, and this is totally me interpreting it my own way, but what might be the connection between these two things, Jocelyn, apart from the mushroom cloud reference? How does a can of soup relate to an atomic weapon? Um. <laughs> Anyone wanna wanna chime in there? It's not a it's not an easy, but you have to kind of think about. It's a mushroom-shaped cloud. 
that's 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 the more easy part of it. There's definitely, I think, a, a possible. That's that's why I think there might be a connection because playing around with a uh, cream of mushroom. Not necessarily to say that his work is about atomic weapons, but what might be the connection between this thing on the right and the thing on the left? What happened at the beginning of the pandemic in terms of uh, Winn-Dixie or the supermarket? What did people do? What's the first thing people did when the pandemic reared its head on the horizon? Bought canned foods and toilet paper? Yeah, toilet paper, right? So you think about it, a painting of toilet paper, we would, if you, someone did a painting of toilet paper right now, you'd be like, oh, the pandemic, right? And that's not so far from painting a can of Campbell's soup as a way to reflect on the specter of nuclear weapons. What's the connection there, uh, AJ Rizzo? Between canned soup and nuclear weapons. Or whoever was talking, I thought it was AJ, but maybe not. Can you say that again? What's the connection between canned, canned goods and nuclear weapons? Did you hear me? You might be uh, cutting it out. Did anyone else? No? What's the connection? Um, possibly like how everyone's buying toilet paper now for the pandemic. Back then, the big thing to do was to buy like canned foods of soup or yeah, vegetables. I mean, yeah, you could see it as sort of like he's painting sort of the familiar thing, something very familiar, but also something yeah. that's very much about survival and sort of security. But there's a yeah. sort of odd this incongruence or odd discrepancy between sort of this uh, product, which represents safety and security and sort of prosperity and the backdrop out of which this thing is created, which is industrialization and war and atomic weapons, which is to say yeah. this, this cream of mushroom soup cannot exist without sort of the backdrop of war and everything else. So there's sort of an odd uh, juxtaposition of security and, and, and having everything provided for and everything being threatened, right? And I don't know if Andy Warhol was doing that necessarily, but I think that might be one way of understanding sort of why you might paint something like this. You have to sort of broaden your sort of horizon. You have to put on a different camera lens and sort of maybe pull it back and sort of look at the bigger picture of what's going on in the world. And that might be one way of looking at it. But I think the first part was a lot more probably up his alley, which is he's sort of rejecting authorship. He's trying to paint something that's very familiar. In the same way, artists have struggled to make you care about artwork by making it naturalistic. Andy Warhol reinvents the whole idea of relatability by giving you something that you buy every day. And he's making you sort of, have, forcing you to challenge the question, well, is this art? Well, is this food? <laughs> I think that's kind of the question. Let's go on and take a look at some more uh, pop art. So you can see another example. Oh, all right. Um, Callie, you were, you were just talking, right? Yeah. So what about here? Mm -hmm. Here we have even less context. So how, you know, what's, what is this all about? Um, it looks like she is on the phone and she might have received, she doesn't really have a lot of emotion in her face, so it's kind of difficult to sort of see like how she's feeling. Her but mouth isn't like even moving, right? No, no, but it looks like she's reacting to something that someone has told her on the other line. Yeah, and there's oddly like little, very little information to sort of triangulate, extrapolate any meaning here. And I think the artists are really sort of kind of like antagonizing you with that lack of information, like forcing you to sound like, well, I don't really get it. And yet there is something appealing about it. And I think the appeal is sort of the comic book. It, it's sort of plucking the child like sort of memory of comic books. And it wants me, we struggle to get meaning, but I think that's going, again, going back to the theme of this era, artists are challenging your whole sort of formula, the recipe for finding meaning by sort of denying you meaning at every turn, at every turn. Um, so I think that's all we'll say about this painting. We'll go back to yep. look at more of it. Uh, I'll give you another one, Callie. How about this one? This one avails itself a little me more meaning. This one, a little more user-friendly, perhaps. Um, what's going on here? Okay, so, let me, I don't want to be incorrect. No one ever does. Good luck. But I know, but it kind of looks like Bill Clinton, but I could be wrong. Yes, Bill Clinton does look a lot like John F. Kennedy. I almost wonder okay. if they're related. For some I, reason. I wonder I if they cloned John F. Kennedy to make Bill Clinton, because when you look at their no. eyes, they're really similar. 
Because I first saw the ring bill and then I thought it was about like the don't ask, don't tell policy. And then I thought it was Bill Clinton for some Don't reason. ask, don't tell, by the way, is when they made in the military, that was a Clinton era. If you're gay, you don't ask, you don't tell, you serve. And that was the, the policy. It was good yeah, so that, that's why I thought because of the rainbow, I was like, oh, maybe that's what they're talking about. But nope, I was very off. But it's, it's true. Bill Clinton and Kennedy have a striking resemblance. And here we see Kennedy, John F. Kennedy. How, and Kennedy's famous for, you know, we will do this, that, and the other thing. We'll send a man to the moon. And he was assassinated. But he also achieved quite a bit in his short tenure as president. And he's just sort of like the Alexander the Great leader where he's young. He has no beard. He's sort of like a Barack Obama, the young president versus the old, uh, the sort of the promise of a young leader versus the sort of, uh, sort of stability of the older traditional leader. Um, and the artist is playing with pop culture, even something as relatable as the president. So here we have subject matter again, but we also have cake and we have a car. And I don't want to spend too much time on this. You can see a vague resemblance to the flag. We'll get to some subject uh, to an art artist who does tackle Kennedy again. I just want to give you a, a little taste of the different art from this era. And we see Andy Warhol playing literally with things we've seen in the past, like the Last Supper here. A uh, Callie, how might this relate to the Last Supper apart from the backdrop or the subject underlying the black and white subject? Um, it looks like that he's kind of like commercialized the painting with the products that he put on top of the Last Supper. Let's yes. See. Yeah. And how about um, the word dove or the dove itself? Oh, yeah, that can be symbolized because back in um, religious times, the dove was used as like a symbol of purity and or prosperity, like it was a sign of hope. And Jesus, I think, was yep. like the dove, the peaceful dove, right? So he is exactly, he's sort of treating, and Andy Warhol was Catholic, and I think he's sort of making fun of sort of the branding aspect of religion and the branding of companies, so sort of so almost pointing out that companies and brands have almost become our new religion, right? They have the same yeah. iconography. They're very recognizable. We worship brands. We worship, you know, I'm an Apple user. Oh, I'm a PC user. Oh my God, you don't own a smartphone? How do you survive? Oh, you don't go to church? How are you Christian? You know, so he's sort of showing an odd, an odd analogy between pop culture and branding and religion. How about here? Who are we looking at? Uh, um, Allie, who are we looking at here? Uh, Liz Taylor. And who is she? I have no idea. Anyone want to tell, tell us who, is, who Liz Taylor is? Anyone that know besides me? She's a famous actress, famous uh, uh, starlet from cinema. And so Andy Warhol, I would say again, is drawing from his Catholic upbringing, and he's offering a sort of pop culture analogy to perhaps the Virgin Mary, a female icon, and treating her with a certain kind of uh, unflattering use of color, or you could perhaps say flattering, but complimentary colors, and more importantly, treating uh, or uh, confronting the aspects of what it means to be a pop icon. I think you'll see that a little more perhaps with this picture here. Allie, who's this one? Marilyn Monroe. And you know who she is? Yeah, she was an actress. Right, so it's sort of, a, a, again, a pop icon. And now we're really kind of in a world that we're familiar with because we all know famous pop culture icons like Kim Kardashian and whatnot. Now, what about, is this a flattering picture of Marilyn Monroe, Allie? Not really. And what is most unflattering about it? Uh, everything's really popping out. Uh, it's just a lot of color and it's not like a detailed kind of thing. It's not like, it doesn't like show her flattering parts. It's kind of just like more about the color. Yeah, exactly. The color is almost more important than her humanity. Um, the color isn't quite put on place, right? It's almost like a, a carelessness to it. Um, and it's very almost like excessive, perhaps, especially when you think about the, the quality of the yellow and the quality of the pink. They're very industrial colors. They're not very uh, warm, at least in terms of uh, what we know from the familiar kind of color scheme of, of skin and hair. And she doesn't have a background, right? The background is oddly sort of makes her floating in space. So how might that relate to pop culture or her, so the phenomenon of being a pop icon? Here's, a, here's another way of thinking about it. This might help think about it. This you could see as a 
uh, sort of reference to photography um, prints, right? The sort of way photography used to be printed and on these sort of, uh, I can't remember what they were called, contact sheets. Uh, what does, and this is a painting by itself. So maybe this one, Allie, might give you a sense of how is, what is Andy Warhol saying about celebrity here? It just looks like she's a, like, cookie cutter. Good, like exactly. She's, when you think about um, a celebrity, like, a lot of us might either worship celebrities or might even think, oh, it would be great to be a celebrity, right? What are the, what's the downside of being a celebrity, Allie? Uh, you're everywhere. Okay, good. One, you're, maybe you're, you're highly visible, right? Uh, who is it? PewDiePie is a YouTuber. He's got like 100 million subscribers, right? And, and I think a lot of you, like me, we spent a last, maybe the last five or 10 years seeing YouTube sort of ascend to sort of a kind of the place where TV was, where we are all no YouTubers, perhaps. And a lot of us might have thought, oh, I could be a YouTuber and like, here's successful people. But what, would it, what does it really mean to be a, YouTube, a successful YouTuber, Ali? What's the, what's the downside of it? Uh, I don't know. Well, maybe like every day you have to like do a video, right? And maybe instead of doing what you want, you, you look at what other people say is good and you start doing what they say is good and, and you become like a, who Jake Paul or one of the Paul brothers who sort of just becomes sort of this empty vessel and doesn't really have any sort of real self because he's become the product of just what other people say they want him to be. And you think about pop culture, um, when you become a celebrity, do, do people care about you as a human being anymore, Allie? No. Yeah, what do they care about? What you put out. Yeah, it's sort of like you're as good as your last movie, or maybe people, especially like you can imagine people play characters, like you play parts in a movie, and then people think you are that character, but you're not, right? You're, you're, you are who you are. And it's a really possibly dehumanizing, destabilizing thing for a person to sort of become the sort of avatar of themselves, right? An avatar is an icon that represents you online, right? But in a, a celebrity is only the avatar. And there's an odd disconnect between that avatar and the real person. And if you're probably the only way to survive that is to develop your persona and to have sort of that be what you put out to the world, but, but then you're, the real you is for when you're at home. So what, do you know what happens to Marilyn Monroe? She dies? Yeah, I think she committed suicide. Um, maybe an overdose, that's usually the case. And this painting, how might this painting um, pay tribute to her or maybe perhaps uh, a requiem, which is a, a memory of someone after they died. How is this painting a requiem for, the, for Marilyn Monroe? Uh, it's like she's a stamp everywhere, but then like how it fades into like nothing. Kind yeah, of like good. Number one, I like that. I hadn't thought about that. It fades into nothing. So she's from the from a brightly colored sort of kind of icon to fading into nothing. Like death is sort of you fading into white, right? Fade to white. Um, what else corresponds to death here? Uh, like how it goes from color to white, black and white. Right, right. Sort of like living color, the phrase, you know, means color corresponds to life. And here are the artists. You know, it's very not genius but it's a importantly good it's a it's a, a clear and easily visually processable understandable use of color or the absence of color to correspond to life and death and i think the artist is is really sort of showing that marilyn monroe she she died and this sort of change from color to black and white is sort of a, a tribute to her and her passing um and of course the idea of a re repetitive image like Celebrities are everywhere, and the way you can be everywhere is by having your painting everywhere. And each of these paintings is slightly different, and yet they're the same. And it's very, you can see it's so dehumanizing based in terms of the color, in terms of sort of the repetition, it's almost like a clone, right? A clone is, once you clone yourself, you're no longer as human anymore. You know, it's like you've lost your individuality. And I think there's something very simultaneously sort of flattering or sort of he, he definitely loves her and sort of is treating her almost like a modern, an updated Virgin Mary. So I, I wouldn't say that he, he's, he's condemning her, but I think he's sort of playing around with the idea that pop culture is sort of, it's a repetitive sort of cloning of the person. It's very much sort of he's embracing the mechanical reproduction as a way to narrate the real visual story that we know as the reality of pop culture. 
and not trying to play and pretend that it's like, like the celebrities are really real people. They're not, they're sort of, they're playing a persona. And you might think about that as the female side of the persona. And here on the left is, is Mapplethorpe, or Robert Mapplethorpe, the photographer, I think addressing the sort of masculine side of celebrity. So what's going on here on the left? Uh, let me pick someone else. Thank you, Ali. Ryan Gilly, are you there? Ryan Iverson? How about, uh, Hello. oh, there we go. Hello, Ryan Iverson. So yep. what's mm -hmm. this picture on the left? What do you think the artist or the photographer is trying to address here? Um, is he like kind of portraying like an outlaw kind of and like a bad boy kind of? Yeah, exactly. I think the artist is here trying to show, tell me at least like uh, several aspects of the bad, bad boy here. Um, him s smoking, um, his a jacket, um, maybe his a uh, hair that's all like messed his, up. Right, so like right out of Greece or something, the movie Greece. Right, yeah. And I think, I don't know if this is how he saw it, but I interpret this as sort of the way men try to look cool mm -hmm. and is, as a corresponding to sort of maybe the way people put that, the gender of cool, right? And that sort of him sort of maybe showing the sort of way um, the, the obsession with being cool and sort of capturing that as its way to just sort of put that in a glass vial and show it to you, show it, reflect it back to you. And yeah, I think a lot of men, you know, especially as you get older, you realize, you start realizing, you know, this obsession with being cool is a very exhausting and probably bad for your health. So you could see the sort of artist playing with um, sort of different concepts. It's almost like we're looking at perhaps uh, concept art and that does become a major part of the art world. We'll see, uh, next uh, next few classes here you can see the artist tackling Andy Warhol Mao Zedong and you know Mao was responsible for murdering millions of Chinese people during the Cultural Revolution and Andy Warhol almost has a blithe disregard uh, for this sort of other political aspects I think he's sort of just treating uh, an image as an image and not maybe c caring too much about these other things and that's for better or for worse um, but definitely challenge sort of tackling subject matter that might be uh, unexpected. Uh, but uh, you know, you perhaps question whether or not you want to be sort of treating a dictatorship with a lot of blood on his hand with the same kind of pop imagery as Marilyn Monroe. And you could see him playing with his Catholic upbringing with him tweaking Last Supper here with colors and even literally copying things like, I think Ryan Gilly was writing about this painting um, by uh, Raphael. And you can see from this overlay, he's literally tracing the image. So there's no originality. Andy Warhol isn't trying to show what a good artist he is. He's really like tracing the, the painting and offering his tracing as a sort of new take on art without any of that originality and without any of the genius we might expect. Like, wow, look at how amazing. I couldn't draw that. He doesn't care about that sort of formula, recipe for, for meaning. He only cares about the sort of perhaps the superficial mechanical aspect of it, not the sort of original originality. Uh, so that's just sort of sort of a way to understand Andy Warhol as sort of a phenomenon that emerges from pop culture. And the other important artist from this era is Robert Rauschenberg. And I guess we'll probably not end on him, but he'll be one of the last ones we see. Uh, we see, uh, once again, we see, see Bill Clinton, right, Callie? Aha, uh -huh, yes. <laughs> So, uh, Victoria, are you there? Yes. So, uh, who are we looking at here? I'll give you a hint. He's on, he's on Kennedy Boulevard, right next to UT. Are you there, Victoria? I can't hear you quite too well. Yeah, sorry, my Wi-Fi was just connect reconnecting. Uh, so, who are we looking at? Well, didn't you guys just say his name? Or yes. am I wrong? But it's not Bill Clinton. Who is it? You know, it's John F. Kennedy. And do you know what happened to John F. Kennedy? What's the most famous thing we know about John F. Kennedy, Victoria? Well, he got shot. Yes, yeah, so there's, again, we're sort of looking at an artist and this year is the year he was shot. So this is definitely the artist reflecting on the assassination of John F. Kennedy. So what about this painting might sort of reference the assassination of John F. Kennedy? 
or even sort of how does he reflect on the legacy of John F. Kennedy? Where's a good starting point? Um, what would you say is the focal point here, Victoria? The focal point, I think, would be him. Yeah, John F. Kennedy, right? And what makes him the focal point? Because he's right in the middle and he has the biggest image. Right, no, that's great. Right, right in the middle, biggest image, and maybe even like the most, the biggest amount of one color. Yeah. And so what's the relationship perhaps to these other things around him? It's hard, right? It's, hard, kinda, it's like it doesn't immediately offer itself to you as sort of like, oh, I get it, right? So it sort of take, might take a little time. Um, so let me kind of walk you guys through how you might consider a painting like this. Absolutely, John F. Kennedy's the focal point, right? But if you think about the language of abstract art and just color and space and composition and movement on their own merits, you might think about these things surrounding him as sort of pieces of the puzzle and there's a certain movement around him, maybe a clockwise movement. And you notice his hand is kind of moving, right? And there's almost like a sense that he's sort of uh, kind of maybe giving some kind of dictation or he's sort of offering some kind of, uh, like he's in, in, give, giving a speech perhaps. So there is kind of a sense that like, there's a subtle sense of movement here, which I think sets things in motion and perhaps this, this astronaut here would be the second most important visual element here. And that might relate to the space program, but also what about this astronaut? Can you tell us, Victoria? What, what is the astronaut doing? Um, well, to me, it looks like that's like a parachute almost behind yeah. it. So how might that relate to Kennedy's death? I don't know. Maybe a fallen angel, like some sort of like a heaven, like a like some kind of an astronaut falling from 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 outer space is similar to maybe a you know he, it's sort of a reference to heaven, kind of giving Kennedy an almost sort of otherworldly heavenly aspect. And I think there is almost like a almost biblical religious like quality here, especially when you might consider. Well, some people have compared the uh, expulsion from Eden to uh, the figures here on the right, um, or I'm sorry, the red area here. And I think that's a little tricky. Um, they don't quite visually look, this little red patch here resembles maybe the, the figures here on the right in terms of the basic sort of abstract shape. But maybe those little vocal lines that we see, the little dotted line might reference the sort of God's voice as shouting or barking to Adam and Eve as they exit Eden. Um, but more importantly, I think, uh, it's very tricky or very difficult to sort of get meaning out of this work because the artists are really playing with a new vocabulary, which is very much based on pop culture, abstraction, and reinventing sort of art for its own sake. And we're gonna pick up on that point um, maybe a little more next week when we look at the work of Dali, who would be an artist who absolutely rejects this sort of abstract expressionism and really is sort of carries on the legacy of the European masters with the same interest in naturalism and maybe subject matter, but with a more surrealist interest, no pop culture, no consumer culture. Um, and arguably a lot, or a lot of art historians might say he's, he's not as important because he does sort of reject the sort of challenge to the art world that the American artists represent. And yet he does work at really big scale. And I think his work is much more visually digestible perhaps than other things we've seen, but it doesn't mean that what we haven't seen doesn't reflect the sort of legacy of the art world with color or art history with color, movement, and artists sort of using the same visual vocabulary we've seen throughout the semester and just sort of trying to reinvent it in a way that's sort of fitting to the era that we're in. And of course, when we get to the present day, we're gonna think about you know digital art, video, and what do artists do? Why, why paint when you have photography, when you have video? And we'll, I guess, pick up with that on Monday. So you guys work on your rough draft, get in touch with me if you haven't about your outline or final draft, which I want you guys to turn in by May 1st. Now here's one little catch. I wanna make sure you guys um, share it with me on a shared um, folder or something so I can see it online and make changes and you can see them online. 
posts and make sure you include the artwork in the layout of the picture that you're going to send me. Uh, any questions about anything, anyone? Thank you. Yep, great. No have, have a wonderful day, guys, uh, and I'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.